Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome to the Fading Memories podcast. I'm so glad you're with us today because we have something interesting as usual. I am talking to Alex Schumacher. He is the author of the graphic novel, The Pick the effects of the pickled herring and it is generally a story about um, teenagers or almost teenagers that discover their grandmother has alzheimer's disease so thanks for joining me alex yeah thank you for having me on it's a pleasure so what was the inspiration for the graphic novel i have lots of authors you're the first graphic novel author no, oh, it's an honor to be that then. <laughs> um, the the inspiration is, is very much based on my experiences with my family. My grandmother, in reality, uh, we, we learned that she was living with Alzheimer's in my late 20s. So it's also, it's joined with the, the kids getting ready for their bar and bat mitzvah, which my sister and I did as well. But the main inspiration behind the, the desire to talk to kids to a younger demographic specifically about alzheimer's was my grandmother and it's something that i'm sure a lot of kids are dealing with and when they're in that position they're not necessarily the primary caretakers because hopefully there's also adults involved Uh, but they're definitely involved and they're seeing it and they're enmeshed in it because there's no way they can't be so i wanted to try and give them something that they could relate to or that they could kind of see some of their own experiences in because to my knowledge i I haven't found many books that talk to a younger audience about these things and they're experiencing them you know just as much as anybody else and in very different ways because they're they're the kids and they're sort of I, i think this unintentionally happens sometimes but they're sort of pushed to the side so the focus can be the relative with alzheimer's or cognitive decline and i don't i don't necessarily judge anyone who does that or or think it's a a bad thing because the the whole goal is to care for that person but we do need to talk to kids about that or, or kids need to have conversations about that too and i'm i'm not sure that it's something that's really widely discussed for that age group so knowing what happened with my grandmother, and again, I was more in my you know late mid to late twenties, so there was a very different type of processing that situation going on. But I think I was still young enough that it it felt like it was sort of my formative years. Still, I'm kind of a late bloomer in in so many ways. So I think I was still very much 15 years old when I was 27. Um, so it, it was it was definitely important to me. It was something that I wanted to have as one of the main story plot points of that book was to talk about how kids are dealing with this and they're they're dealing with so many things anyway they're you know they're tweens they're they're becoming teens they they're trying to find out where they fit in not just you know in the world in that very kind of generalized way they're trying to find out where they fit in their family in their you know social scene and with their group of friends uh and and where they fit in their family a lot of times so this was yeah like i said i think it was just something that felt very natural to me to talk to a younger generation about this i know there's kids for or kids books for little kids you know, like mm-hmm. early elementary school kind of kids, yeah. but yeah. I'm not, I'm not familiar with teens and tweens, you know, as the target. Um, I'm going to have to check my, my favorite book resource, All's Authors. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Um, I have not checked that. No, but, but yeah, I, I, I've seen the ones for the younger readers too. And there does seem to be some weird sort of chasm <laughs> between very young readers and then adult readers for that material uh, about living with a relative with cognitive decline and Alzheimer's. And I've also seen, you know, adult graphic novels that are about an adult dealing with their parent or possibly even a grandparent, but I think it's more, um, parents, but but there's some memoirs out there that are definitely dealing with that through the perspective of an, of an adult. So this is again something that I 
I, I hadn't seen much of him. And there could very well be other graphic novels out there for this this age, you know, eight to twelve or so. Um, but but the focus was on family too. And since this was kind of the burgeoning demographic for middle grade, I thought what a wonderful opportunity to be able to talk to that age group about it. So you said you were in your bang on my mic here. <laughs> you were in your late mid to late twenties. So mm -hmm. were you involved in any of your grandmother's care? So for the first few years, uh, I, cause I, I grew up in Salinas, Steinbeck country. That's kind of where the whole love of writing stemmed from, but I moved to San Francisco, uh, in, in my twenties. It just, there was more opportunity there. I was able to get involved with some great cartoonist groups like the cartoon art museum, the national cartoonist society, and really try to start getting my education that way. Um, but I was up there till I was about 28, I believe. And my grandmother started showing signs of Alzheimer's when I was about 25. So there was two or three years where my involvement was fairly minimal just because of you know geographical proximity. But I did move back to Salinas when I was 28. And from that point until her her passing, I was pretty heavily involved because we we lived you know, five minutes from my grandparents. And that had been uh, sort of the living situation from when I was very young. My parents divorced and we moved up to Salinas because that's where my grandparents were and we had the familial support there. And, and that was also something that was incredibly important for me to include was to show that kind of support and that love that's very, you know, important to dealing with these issues. Um, but so we moved up there and, and my grandparents were a daily fixture in my life. Uh, so, you know, when all of that started happening in my 20s, uh, you know, we again, we lived very close uh, for my entire life. And, and thankfully so, since we were there to be able to care for her. And, you know, it's always, as you well know, you know, it's so incredibly gut wrenching and heartbreaking to watch somebody that you love go through this and you know, you care for them the best that you can and you do for them what you can. But, you know, ultimately that, you know, you know that there's no way you can stop it. And there's just something that's so that, that you never really get past with that. So I so part of the message in the book, too, is it's OK to have those feelings and we need to be able to talk about those things like we were talking about a little bit before we were recording where, you know, the the time and the space that we need to grieve is so important. And I feel a lot of the times as as a culture or as humanity, even we tend to have this idea about being tough is the right way to move forward in life. And, you know, you don't let things affect you. But for me, in my experience and, and things that I've seen in my 43 years, that proves to just be you know, damaging and, and you're going to have to deal with it at some point. It's going to burst forth at some point. And often when we let it fester, you know, that's that's when it comes out in very unhealthy ways. And especially, you know, if you are in a caregiver role, you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you might take that out on the person that you're caring for. And and that happens a little bit in the book because the main character Micah is experiencing this all of these emotions again with varying aspects of his life but certainly the one where he sees you know his grandmother start dealing with this is part of you know he, there's a couple outbursts in the book and part of those are because he doesn't know what to do with those feelings he doesn't know where to put them or how to you know deal with them so that's it's a that's a pretty uh, integral part of self-care during that too, which is important when you're caring for other people. So those were all things that I wanted to include because I think kids need to know those as well. I agree. And your characters are 12 and 13. Yes, so that's, that's not a great time for not knowing how to handle things like wacky emotions to start with. No. <laughs> and that's when all of the hormones and the emotions really start kicking into high gear and going, you know, it's sort of out of control anyway. So then you add on this, this very sort of a, a adult, you know, aspect or this adult uh, thing that you're dealing with. And, you know, the, where does all of that emotion go? You know, the, oftentimes you just have nowhere to put it. <laughs> 
Um, and there's but, always this part of us that just really, you need your grandma sometimes. So yeah. I'm the oldest grandkid on both sides. My mom was the oldest. Both my parents were the oldest kids. They had kids young. Their siblings had kids older. So my, I am significantly older than my cousins. <laughs> my cousins are closer to my daughter's age than mine. Mm. Um, and my daughter will be 33 this year. So okay. it's, uh, it's, a little, it's a little weird, but it was when my grandparents, my maternal grandparents retired in 1985 and went traveling. They traveled the country in their fifth wheel, which was cool. Yeah. Um, but then they'd come home and go visit the little kids. It's like, excuse me, I don't <laughs> care that I'm college age. I want my grandma. <laughs> yeah. And then there's some sort of, you know, maternal connection because mine was my maternal grandmother as well. And and there's just something that I think we all have instinctively where that cries out in us from time to time. And there's nothing wrong with that. But then when you when the, when the roles sort of switch and I show that a little bit in the book where you're now the one that this person that you relied on is going to for their own comfort and for their support. It, it can be sort of this really bittersweet moment because you you received care from them your entire life. You relied on care for them your entire life. And and how how much how much of a gift is that that I got to do that? I mean, because I know so many people who didn't grow up anywhere near their grandparents and, you know, grandparents were people that you saw on holidays and, you know, three, four times of a year, I got to grow up around them every day. And, and I felt like, especially because of how things ended up happening, uh, it's just such a blessing that I got to spend that much time with them. But I also think that makes it a lot more noticeable or apparent when even the slight things start to change, which were, these little, you know, signals or, or uh, Easter eggs that I, I layered in throughout the book too, where it's, you can start to see anybody who's, who's experienced this with relatives, you can see the little, you know, the signs, the writing on the wall, as it were, but, you know, the kids are starting to try to process that, but that's really what it is, is they had, you know, I grew up around my parents, they grew up, the kids in the book grew up around their grandparents. So it's, you notice when things are amiss, even if you can't pinpoint exactly what that is. That makes sense. So you're a little bit older now. How would you... Little, not so wiser, <laughs> but a little older. <laughs> I should have thrown that in. How would you advise, like, adults your age, my age, somewhere in there, that are that have got teens and tweens? You know, you want to protect them from ugliness, but... You can't protect them from every aspect of life. So how would you, right. how would you start with? Oh, hey, you know, I I see you're going through this, and you've got these kids. Mm -hmm. What would you suggest? Do they? How would you advise them? I I actually wrote a little scene in the book where the mom is sitting the kids down because she has this realization in in a moment of kind of raised emotion, you know, with the kids and her, that she realized she hasn't really touched base with them or asked them, you know, what they were seeing and then try to put it into terms that they can understand what Alzheimer's is. So I think that's really the first step with anybody is it, we have to be honest with kids and, and age appropriately, of course, but I think it's okay to tell them that you know, grandma's brain is changing, you know, you're going to notice certain things which you may have already noticed. She, you know, can forget things or, you know, she may be more irritable because, you know, as we know, Alzheimer's can manifest in so many different ways. So I think it's okay to, to tell them about, it. especially at 12 or 13, they're old enough to comprehend, you know, what you're telling them. You know, if it gets a little younger, you know, that gets a little more difficult to do because their brains are still developing and they can't quite understand everything, you know, that that, you know, tweens and teens can. But but honesty, as cliche as it sounds, I think honesty is the best policy. And, you know, when it really becomes you can shelter them for a while, depending on how the Alzheimer's progresses, you know, the age of the person who has Alzheimer's, because, you know, it varies so drastically. So I think, but there, there does come a point where it's very clear that something is wrong. 
for lack of a better term. So at that point, honesty is just the way to go. You, you know, uh, there's no point in keeping a kid in the dark because they're going to feel maybe betray is too strong of a word, but they'll, they'll feel like you weren't honest with them. And I, and I think that can feel a little bit like a betrayal if, if we don't actually bring them into that conversation and let them know what's going on. So that's really what it comes down to. And I, and I think most, I would like to think that most parents are pretty open and honest with their kids. And especially, you know, nowadays there, there are more conversations about things like self-care, things like having open conversations and communication about things. So those, those narratives are, are changing for the better, I, I believe. And some of that's with social media, but that's also why I think it's so important to kind of get ahead of that because it's far better for our kids to find things out from us than it is for them to find out from some stranger on the internet where, you know, they could get a lot of misinformation or, you know, be sort of subjected to horrors that you don't necessarily want them to. So the the best thing to do is just talk to them. And again, you do, you know, in an age appropriate manner, you can't, give them everything because that's a really heavy load yeah. to, to drop on a kid. But, but you can definitely give them, you know, the, the most honest explanation that you can it just clues them in to let them know that yes, something's going on your mind. You know, we don't want to gaslight kids. So yes, something is going on. Grandma's or grandpa's mind is changing, et cetera. And the most important thing to, for me in my mind is letting them ask questions. It's not even Definitely. about, yeah, it's not even about necessarily telling them everything, you know, and, and just talking at them <laughs> until you think they understand. But it's about, it's about asking questions because that's, that's really what most things are about in life really is, you know, the smartest people are the ones who know that we have more questions than answers. And, and kids are so inquisitive and, and really just on an instinctive level, they know that something's going on already. So there's no real point in in you know obfuscating any further once that point hits. So conversation and and most importantly questions I think are the best the best approach there. And you can't protect them if you try to protect them and they know something's going on. I think you said betrayal. They're definitely not going to feel protected. It's right. gonna it's gonna be worse. And I guess I could, the only thing I could add to that is this is not a one-time conversation. Absolutely. No, and no, no. Almost better in like little small bites because it's a lot. Yeah. And I and, guess that's, that's kind of what I was getting at too. You put it perfectly. That's kind of what I was getting at with the questions is that needs to be, like you said, something that's allowed perpetually, you know, there, there, there shouldn't be like, okay, we're having this conversation and you can ask me five questions now and then we're moving past it. It has to be something that is an ongoing, continual, kind of living thing in a way because it's it's going to change for them as they get older and understand more. It's going to change as you are around it more and learn more about the disease. So it's this ever-changing and ongoing conversation that's so in, integral to having everybody deal with it in a, in a as healthy way as possible. One of the things I always recommend to people is that they get as much learning and training as possible. And I cannot believe in seven plus years of doing this show, I have not actually contemplated this, but so let me think my mom's, my mom started showing signs of Alzheimer's. Like she basically had it all my daughter's life. And my, my daughter got all the good years. My niece was born in 2005, and by then my mom was like mid stages. And so I'm like trying to think if at like 14, 15, her taking like a savvy caregiver class, like the Alzheimer's Association puts on, if that would have been beneficial or not. I guess that's something you'd have to determine on a kid by kid basis. But yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I can't. I'm like, I was thinking about that. I'm like, you know, if you're the primary caregiver or you're one of them, that that is absolutely necessary to learn you know um yeah. like which behave like which behaviors common behaviors what what's triggering them what am i doing that's triggering this outburst or this whatever this hostility or the pacing you know just some of the stuff that's typical can very yeah. frequently be 
traced back to some sort of either emotional or environmental trigger. So I think kids understanding that would be beneficial. Maybe the webinars that are shorter would be good. Yeah. yeah. And I think understanding that, but also understanding that, you know, if, if like irritation or aggravation, anger, if any of those things are part of the Alzheimer's equation for their relative, it's also important for them to understand that it's not their fault. It's not, you know, their, their grandparents are different and that's not the grandparent that, you know, they remember. And we need to hold space for for the good memories too. That's such an important thing for kids to do. And, you know, I have a couple flashbacks in the book, which is sort of touching on that a little bit where remembering the good times is just as important as dealing with the, you know, difficult times while they're actually going through Alzheimer's. And I think it's just such a, a detrimental way to to go about it, to think that we we can't also find happiness and humor while this is happening. I, I think those are huge tools for us to use. And and the fact that we that that it can be um sort of frowned upon to to laugh during tough times, I, I find not very helpful because we need to be able to do that. I mean, because there's no child out there who has ever been so sad that they can't laugh. You know, every child is able to find some humor somewhere. Maybe it's not a lot, you know, it's more for some kids than others, but they need to know that it's okay that, that they can still find humor and happiness uh, amidst this sorrow and, and these tragic things that are happening. It's, it's not a, you know, one size fits all when, when it comes to dealing with this. And, you know, we have to do our, as adults, for ourselves as much as kids, we need to do our best to facilitate whatever unique way they need to process it. You know, that's a really good point too, because I can, I am like, if I can shave off half my daughter's life, mm-hmm. I can, I can picture them feeling guilty for yeah. having fun with their friends or going to a school dance or whatever it is that brings them joy. And that's, that is not what we want kids to experience. No, they're There's... still kids. They need to be able to, to have those formative young experiences just as much as anybody else. And and the fact that their family and, and they, you know, by proxy are also going through these terrible things that doesn't mean that their life has to be terrible 100% of the time. And hopefully, if we're doing our jobs well, as somebody who doesn't have a child yet, but if, we, if we're doing our jobs well, you know, hopefully we're letting them know that that is okay and they, they shouldn't feel guilty about that. So if you had a friend or a colleague and you knew they were caring for a parent with Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia and they had kids, what would you... Like what, what advice would you give to them? I mean, we've obviously, we've talked about being open and honest and, and allowing questions and making sure they know that it's okay to be happy. Um, those are kind of the big over, overarching themes, but like, do you have any daily day to day nitty gritty kind of advice back from your, when you were helping care for your grandma? I mean, maybe this is a little more general than you were looking for, but I I do think that you know, letting them, you know, starting the education at a younger age could be really beneficial because again, kids are not dumb. (laughs) Sometimes we, we can dismiss their intellects at times simply because, you know, they're younger and don't know as much as we do, but that certainly doesn't mean that they're stupid. So I don't think there is too young of an age. I mean, if they're already dealing with this, I don't think there's too young of an age to start with some education and you know depending again age appropriate is the the mo (laughs) i think with any kind of discussions with kids about this but if they start to understand it because when anybody starts to understand things that are foreign to them that's when it becomes less scary our our natural instinct as humans is to fear what we don't know and you know we've seen that play out throughout history sometimes it's You know, it's in xenophobia. Sometimes it's in, you know, whatever way. But once we start to understand things and are able to contextualize them for ourselves in in whichever way makes sense to us, that's when we can start to actually 
deal with them in a way that's positive, that's constructive, that will be useful and helpful to the person that we're caring for. And, and if everybody kind of understands what's happening to to whatever degree they need to, um, that's that's something that I think is incredibly incredibly um, uh, vital. And the, I think the day-to-day -day stuff, honestly, is what we were talking about before, the, the not guilting yourself if you have a moment of joy or a moment of levity or you you laugh at a video online. You know, there's no reason to make yourself feel bad b because you are dealing with this very sad thing because you're dealing, you know, your family is going through this, you know, transitional and rough time it's so important for us not to guilt ourselves when we do find spare moments of happiness because those those are really good what's going to carry us through so and kids kids find joy in the, one of the wonderful things about kids is they truly find joy in in a lot of things so much simplicity that they can still find joy in and we need to allow them to do that we need to i think help them do that in, in whatever way we can. And let them know that that, again, because self-care is such a huge part of being a caretaker. We can't be at our best for somebody if we're not at our best and if we're not taking care of ourselves. And, and it's no different for kids. They need to, you know, be able to, you know, be kids essentially, <laughs> you know, and, and be able to, to practice whatever kind of self-care you know kids can and a lot of times i think it's more uh, uh sort of subconscious for kids when they're doing that but as adults we can recognize it and know okay they're they're laughing at a video that's great they're you know allowing themselves a moment away from these you know kind of mournful sorrowful things that we're dealing with and that we're we're seeing you know, as, as often as you do with your grandparents. Again, for me, it was every day. It, it's not that way for every kid. And there's almost, again, I said, you know, I said it was a blessing that I got to see him every day. And now I'm going to completely contradict myself and say <laughs> that, you know, maybe when something like Alzheimer's comes into play, it, it can be almost to their, to their benefit to, um, you know, not see their, their grandparents as much, but e either way, I, I, think we need to, again, uh, allow them those moments throughout their day where they can find some relief to be relieved and to not, you know, chastise them about that or make them feel guilty about it because of this terrible things happening with grandma or grandpa or mom, whatever the case may be. You know, they need to know that it, it's okay that they're not just sad all the time because that's not useful to anybody. No, it's not good for our mental health at all. But you no. said something about kids being able to find joy in the simplest things. Yeah. And I've seen younger kids and tweens interact with a grandparent and just be goofy, silly kids. Yeah. And the grandparent is laughing and the caregiver has got a moment of respite because everybody's happy. So I think encouraging them to share their joys. Oh, you, your soccer team won the game or, you know, the boy asked you to the dance or you asked the boy to the dance or whatever it's yeah, you know just sure. just engaging in the the simpler parts of life i think is easier for kids which makes it <laughs> and it's easy for somebody with some sort of disease that affects the brain yeah. to process i mean that was one of the challenges with my mom it was like i can only dumb this down so much and i don't mean dumb as in like you know, I didn't talk baby talk or anything to her, but it's just right. superficial conversations. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, it's just oh yeah, yeah. It's like after a while, I was like, I got stuff to do. I can't have this conversation again. Yeah, <laughs> and, I and that's think, the thing. Yeah, it can be really daunting. And I somehow kids are better at that. I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe because they don't have five hundred things to do every day. <laughs> I think that's a huge part of it. Is the the responsibilities of adulthood haven't yet crushed their <laughs> souls. <laughs> so yeah. I think they're able to move past things a little bit quicker because there isn't something waiting right around the corner for them necessarily like it is in adulthood. We deal with one thing and then there's, again, like we were talking about just before this, there's, you take care of one thing and then there's 50 other things that are waiting for you. And thankfully, especially in these kind of scenarios, kids aren't encumbered with that sort of existence. So, you know, if they're dealing with something like 
grandparents or parents who are dealing with Alzheimer's, I mean, they do have other aspects of their life that they're dealing with, but something, something like tragic for, for lack of a better word, I, I think they, they have the ability more so than adults because of what we were just talking about to be able to continue forward and, and not, not feel sort of burdened as much and maybe burdens not right. Because I don't think anybody who's caring for a, a relative with Alzheimer's necessarily considers it a burden, but it, it can feel burdensome, I suppose, because it, it is interrupt, you know, it can interrupt your life and it can, you know, interrupt, you know, normal routines and schedules and kids need that too. So when those sort of, when there's that sort of disruption um, for younger people, you know, those that can often be a little more jarring to them than I think just dealing with a issue or having an issue come at them and being able to sidestep it because kids are very good about that. <laughs> I also think great. that instinctively, because like my mom seemed to know she thought I was her best friend, but instinctively she seemed to remember she was mom, which drove me bananas. But she <laughs> was she was never like a baby baby person she she preferred older kids and i remember there was a family visiting in memory care and they had he had to be like barely two and that kid was running around shrieking you know that high pitched <laughs> shriek that toddlers can do oh this i am kid, familiar yeah oh boy everybody's familiar but you could hear this kid <laughs> in every crevice of this building <laughs> yeah. and i thought oh boy my mom's going to start complaining because um, many people with Alzheimer's can't tune out noises yeah. and they just become an irritant. Yeah. yeah, so much quicker. And he came like ricocheting out into the courtyard where we were. And my oh. mom just interacted with him like, you know, like she was his grandmother. And I thought that's really fascinating. So mm. it's, I think instinctively they must remember like that parental feeling or that grandparent feeling at least that's kind of what I got with my mom. My yeah, sister totally... used to, she Sorry. used to take my mom to my niece's basketball games until the, um, the moving from point A to point B got more difficult. The squeaky tennis shoes on the floor. I mean, that sound makes me, uh, yeah, so, sure. it's like, I don't, that's the re main reason I don't watch basketball, yeah. but, um, it just got really difficult, but my mom enjoyed it. And it's like, my mom was not that kind of sports fan. Um, my sister played baseball when we were kids. We were on swim team, so we weren't like soccer, base or basketball kind of kind of kids. But I just think they they somehow know that, and I think that relationship is beneficial. They help each other a little bit, and it kind of benefits the main caregiver because they get a little bit of respite to take care of one of those other fifty things on the to do list. Right. Yeah, and I, and I think you know when you're a parent and then a grandparent, there's there's got to be some sort of ingrained instinct that when those sort of interactions come about, you can just kind of snap back into place or, or you can find that way of comporting yourself. That, that's the brain is so fascinating in those ways that, you know, the, they could, it, it, like with my grandmother, you know, we would ask her what she ordered for lunch five minutes after she ordered it at a restaurant and she couldn't remember. But if you asked her, you know, who she went to her junior high school dance with back in Milwaukee. She would know the name. She would know, you know, what the weather was like. And it's just, it, it always just amazes me the way that our brains can work. So it's not, it's not really surprising to think that these experiences that are, are such a part of their being will still be there, even if they start experiencing cognitive decline and all they need is that catalyst of having a kid or having somebody interact with them in, in some sort of parental way and boom there it is grandma's back out grandma's here and it, it that that was always something that i did notice with my grandmother even as she was in decline you know there was never a lack of that kind of maternal love support even if she didn't know what was necessarily going on in the conversation the general idea of her reactions was always loving and nurturing and, and it was really delightful. But you also hit on something else. I think having letting kids, depending on, on the communication of the Alzheimer's uh, or of the person with Alzheimer's, because 
again, communication can also vary wildly. Some are you are non communicative. Some some still you know hold conversation is just fine. So kind of depending on that, I also think letting kids have conversations with their relatives well into the, the, the state of Alzheimer's that they're in can be really important because that will help that connection stay in, in the grandparents' mind too. And, and there was something I was reading recently about like art therapy for uh, patients with with cognitive decline, where you know creating new memories is something that's so important to to kind of being you know kind of living with this, and and one way to do that is to continue having conversations with them and continue trying to treat them as normally for you know quote unquote normally as we can and, until it's just not possible anymore. But definitely those kind of conversations and the idea of creating new memories is something that that always struck me from from that essay that I was reading. It makes sense. And I think yeah. also not discouraging them for engaging in playful activities with grandma, you know, just like playing yeah. with her like you would a kid your own age. Um, I don't know. I didn't interact with my niece and my mom too often because we visited separately because it was better for everybody. Um, but I think I've seen on the social media, one gal's taking care of her grandmother and her younger nieces and nephews. Like one time, and I think her niece must have been somewhere between 10 and 12. So she was a tween and yeah. she kept play acting, walking with a cup full of colored pencils and tripping and falling and spilling all the pencils and grandma would laugh. And she must have done that multiple times. I'm like, I could probably do that three times before I'd want to use one of those pencils and poke my you know head poke my eye out or so jab it into my brain. Yeah. Um, but they're cognitively, they're at more of that mental stage of development. I mean, they're not kids, so we don't treat them like kids, but we, don't, we should also allow them to be a little bit more free with how they express themselves. And I think kids are better at bringing that out. Yeah, definitely. Because there's a certain amount of regression, you know, with, mm -hmm. with everybody who has Alzheimer's and cognitive decline. So like you said, uh, you know, sometimes it can be that they're sort of, again, not not um, intellect, but sort of maybe their senses of humor or their, you know, their mentality about certain things can can sort of be on par, closer to on par with the kids at one point than it can be with the adults. And Sometimes that can almost be a blessing in disguise because then you can still have them involved in these activities, both the kids and and the person with the disease. It, you know, it, it can be so fulfilling for both of them to be, mm -hmm. um, you know, b doing that together. So, yeah, yeah, I think that's one of the biggest things. And I know you've talked about this on the podcast before, mm -hmm. you know, a huge part of having a family member and caring for somebody with this disease is rolling with the punches and you kind of just have to take the changes as they come. And that's another thing that ties back in to the ongoing conversation with kids is as things progress, as things change, you know, we need to be able to talk to them about that. And, and because they're going to notice again, kids aren't stupid. And, and if they're around their grandparents or their parents, whoever has the disease, if they're around them enough, they're going to notice when things are different, even if they can't, you know, articulate what that difference is. So just like with us as adults, when we need to keep, you know, learning about it, keep, you know, rolling with everything that comes our way, we need to be, you know, good about bringing those kids along with us and, and again, letting them ask questions, but also informing them of certain things that might be different going forward. There was um in my other home, my old hometown, there was a daycare that was strongly encouraged to add adult day programs to their offerings. And mm -hmm. they did. And I, this is a very old episode. I'll link it in the show notes. The um, older adults were there from like late morning or mid morning to early afternoon. In the morning, they'd bring over the preschoolers for some grandparent time. And mm -hmm. the kids would play with the people in the, adult day program you know some of them would color some of them would do like the cornhole toss there's a lot of options and i think they might have stayed for maybe 45 minutes to an hour it's probably more than plenty of time you don't want to overstimulate everybody and then the afternoon the late elementary school age kids so like third through fifth grade they would come and spend time with these adults and some some of them 
could actually read to the kids because there were simpler books. They mm. could help with some basic math, which don't expect me to do that if I get Alzheimer's. I can't help you with basic <laughs> math now. So, yeah, but there, the um, in talking to the director about how this program worked with integrating the kids and the adults, it was very obvious that there was a third person who was not present who was getting massive benefits from these children and these adults interacting and that was the like working family caregiver who you know their their person came home from the day program you know and happy engaged tired so maybe they didn't have sundowning as often you yeah. know they might be ready to just kind of sit and do their own coloring or maybe flip through a magazine while they took care of dinner and the kids took care of homework it's just there's a real benefit to not segregating kids out of caregiving because you know it's it's really you can kind of get the benefit but it's like i didn't experience it personally but i strongly felt what was what was happening at that program and um they I gotta next time I go back for a haircut, I gotta see if they're still doing both because I know it was kind of a struggle because it was still kind of a new concept to have the day program. Um, but I thought it was superior because they integrated the kids. So absolutely, that's that's a fantastic initiative and one that you know I hope we see more of going forward because again, I think there are so many kids out there that are dealing with this and and some of them kind of feel like they have to suffer in silence to some degree and i don't i'm not i don't necessarily think parents are telling them you know they they can't have feelings about it but sometimes i think as kids if if not you know given a little bit more direction kids can often just want to stay out of the way because they see these things happening they see their parents stressed out and concerned and you know often you know maybe just want to help by you know not being in the way but the the best thing that we can do for them are programs like that that you know put them directly in the way because that that makes them a part of the experience and they learn the people who are you know suffering from cognitive decline and alzheimer's get a lot out of it like you said the families who are the primary caregivers get it, it's almost like two or threefold because they get the the benefit of having you know, some stimulation for the the people that they're caring for, as well as having the kids get experience and possibly some just education through, um, you know, hands-on education with those people who have those diseases. And, and it's just, it should be more prevalent. And, you know, I know it's something that still being studied and, you know, people have to be somewhat cautious about how how much or how little you know kids know but doing something like that and really really integrating them and making it kind of almost an immersive thing for the kids where they're they they feel like they're a part of it and then the the you know older patients feel like they're not completely forgotten and cut off as well and that's that's incredibly important for for them to feel like they're not being forgotten about yeah, and the, the engagement is important for just to keep negative behaviors from being triggered. But, it, yeah. you know, when they're learning and engaged and, you know, they're using their brain, then you can live better with the disease for longer. I hope that makes sense. It doesn't sound grammatically correct, but you can live well with the disease if you stay engaged and you're learning new things and you're staying social and all those good things that aren't always easy. Yeah, because with like the art therapy, it, it, well, it's a similar thing because it's it's just it's having them engaged in something where they're having to use their brains. And with art specifically, it's you know the combination of problem solving that you have to do with art uh, combined with the imagination that that you have to use while making art. And those two things together create the um, the new channels, the the dendrites, which um, end up actually improving brain function and i and i can only imagine the program where they're interacting with kids and and being allowed to play and have fun it, it has to have a similar effect i can't imagine that it wouldn't and and that's such a valuable thing for them to be able to do especially when 
you know, if you're older and, and almost incapacitated to a degree, or you have to rely on other people, having some sense of freedom, it, you can't replace that with anything else. And I know for my grandmother, that was a huge thing because like when we had to ask her to stop driving and we had to take away her license and then there's this loss of freedom that's so just innate or not innate, but, but just, um, it hits them so viscerally because it's, it's this loss of independence to a large degree, which is, I don't think anybody would, you know, react well to that. So if we can give them these moments where they, they feel free to, to laugh and to play and, and they have some independence that's, mutually advantageous for both the kids and the adults in that situation nope that is that is i think like doing art therapy solo but doing it with kids i think is actually multiple better absolutely i, I could speak it's english I, I really can <laughs> so <laughs> i was gonna ask is there gonna be a sequel uh so there is a story in the works that could potentially be a sequel. My agent and I had had talked about it. Uh, it is not the book that we're going to be pursuing next per se. Uh, but if we can get a little bit, you know, get a few more eyes on this book, get it a little more attention to where, you know, a sequel might actually be something that people want. Um, I would I would love to go back to it because those those characters, you know, it's it's Ramona Clef, so it's not you know, autobiographical, it's not memoir, but it's very heavily based on my family. And oh, the one thing I wanted to say too, cause we were talking about humor was my grandmother was always such a goof and, and joking and humor was such a huge part of all of our family really. So when we saw those kind of sparks come back from time to time, that was such a huge, you know, it was a relief, but it was also a joy for all of us to be able to 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 see that, to see this display of this person that she was and these things that she enjoyed and hearing her laugh. So as much as we can incorporate that into the experience of caretaking, I think the better. I agree. It's hard enough as it is. Yeah. Definitely got to have some laughs. <laughs> You do. And, and it's not because I think the, the problem is it can be mistaken for like laughing at the situation or making light of the situation. And that's not what it is. It's, it's allowing us to, you know, trudge forward through this experience by maintaining some sense of self and humor and, you know, family support. And, and again, the only way that we can really do that is if we're OK, because when we're OK, we're not going to be able to make sure anybody else is OK. Very true. Well, as I said earlier, I'm not quite done, but I have enjoyed reading the graphic novel. I don't think I've ever read a graphic novel in my life, which is kind of surprising considering one, I'm an eighties kid and two, I love reading. So thanks for filling that little hole in my, in my, uh, whatever, my, my reading journey. Yeah. Something like that. That's that we're recording this the day after Memorial day. Lucky my brain's working at all. Yeah. We've all got the, the hangover or the weekend hangover. Even if we don't drink, uh, there, yeah, I don't drink. But I, man, I've I've project myself into like seriously needing a vacation. <laughs> That's what we do. We try to fit it all in on the weekend. <laughs> yep, it's like oh, I have extra 15, 20 minutes. Let's like squeak in this little little project, and like oh boy, by eight yeah. o'clock I'm just gone. <laughs> that just ties into everything we were saying. I mean that that's such a normal part of life, and then when we add caretaking into that, it it can be incredibly overwhelming, and then just as much so for kids. So I feel like it's a it's kind of an honor for me to be able to talk to a younger generation about that and and maybe you know give them something to talk to their families about or or have sort of an I don't know a, a little bit more insight into what they can do to if they're in that situation and hopefully I'll be able to go out and talk to more kids about it because I've I've had some events some book signings and had some really great conversations so my my hope is that that continues. Well, unfortunately, for better or worse, I think you're going to have to do a sequel because <laughs> the silver tsunami is upon us and we are not ready. So, yeah, that is true. We, we, we need to get ourselves ready and the kids ready and the effects of the pickled herring that you wrote is a good place to start. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. You're welcome. 
Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.